Okay, good evening, everyone. My name is Jose Vega. I hope everybody can hear me okay. I will be filling in for Dennis Speed. Uh, tonight, we have Daniel Burke, who will be talking about uh, what will be going on in D.C., and then we'll also have uh, Jerry Rose, who will be going through the TVA and the FDR presidency and more, and that should be really exciting. Now, but before we go to our speakers, I would just like to reference a couple things. People may be aware about these earthquakes that have been happening um, in Syria and Turkey and such, and um, there have been uh, sanctions placed on Syria that have uh, prevented aid from being allowed to go into Syria. And this has, of course, been promoted by organizations like the National Endowment for Democracy, also known as the arm of the CIA. And I'd like to reference that we had done an intervention. By we, I mean myself and Kynan, which we will go through a little later. And so I'm just referencing that now so that when we get to the Q&A period, we can uh, bring that up and discuss that too in perspective with what uh, Daniel and uh, Jerry are bringing up. Apart from that, uh, these last two weeks have been very exciting. We've had uh, intervention after intervention, after intervention, several interventions. Uh, for example, uh, Daniel Burke, one of our speakers, uh, had intervened on um, AOC, Bowman, and Chuck Schumer and was just on the Kim Iverson show. Um, and uh, myself and Kynan and Dewey intervened on Congressman Espaillat, who's on the Foreign Affairs Committee. He's a ranking member on that Foreign Affairs Committee. And I was also on the Kim Iverson show. We had a big international resounding um, impact. Um, it, the subtitles were dubbed over into uh, Spanish, and we got a big international response from people in Japan, Germany, Uruguay, Spain, um, and uh, the German comments were interesting because they were saying, wow, we didn't know that people in Harlem heard about these comments from this politician named Baerbach who said Germany is at war with Russia. And so we are moving along. Things are moving along. Things are, are, are very, very um, optimistic in my view. doesn't mean things are easy, but they're optimistic. And so with that introduction out of the way, I'd like to go to our first speaker, Daniel Burke, and then we will hear from Jerry Rose. So, Daniel, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. How are you? Oh, you know, I'm, I'm here, hanging in. <laughs> okay, here I am. All right, pardon me. I didn't know I was coming in so quickly. I had, I had the microwave going here. Anyway. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it's great to talk to you all tonight. Um, my my job is to kind of give you guys a sense of what we're doing, um, what this kind of, these interventions that Kynan, Jose, um, and many of us have been doing, how these are feeding into a process, um, how all of our international work is feeding into a process that is going to have a certain exciting, uh, you know, inflection point coming up on February 19th at the rally in Washington, D.C., the Rage Against the War Machine rally organized by the People's Party and the Libertarian Party. So there's a lot to mm, communicate about what's going on here. So, but I'm going to try to keep it to, I want to give you an, a vision of how we're going to win. What is the process by which we change the the way that people think, crucial, crucial people who have shown uh, leadership, who have shown that they're willing to uh, move to, to bring many different people with different views together to stop nuclear war, which is what you're going to get. I mean, the list of speakers for February 19. Uh, continues to get longer, and it, ha it hit a certain high when it became clear that Tulsi Gabbard, Ron Paul were coming in person, along with many other people who I could, I could list at length, uh, but representing a wide variety of people, a wide variety of political views. What I think that that demonstrates 
is that various people with pretty significant ambitions, I mean, Tulsi Gabbard certainly looks like she wants to run for president again, have identified the importance fundamentally of this event and the power of it, the power of this process that has been unfolding, which, you know, I just remind people, like Tulsi Gabbard responded on Tucker Carlson, no, I believe it's Jesse Waters' show on Fox News, specifically to the work done by Kynan and Jose back in uh, October uh, when they first confronted AOC. Um, so there is a kind of an unbroken process here where the, the kinds of interventions that, um, that we've been doing have, have given a bite, a certain kind of courage or excitement to people about what is to come. And, um, you know, Dewey and I, uh, we went to a, uh, a fundraiser for AOC and Schumer and Jamal Bowman Actually, it was the three of them hosting a, a fundraiser for a council a council candidate, and uh, we got we communicated clearly what we had to say um, passionately, uh, bringing up the proposals from President Lula of Brazil, bringing up the proposal of the Pope for peace negotiations, and demanding that they uh, respond to that, and that yielded a continued kind of unfolding of this organizing process where I was able to get interviewed by Kim Iverson, who has also interviewed Jose uh, on a previous, a previous intervention. Um, and, you know, 60, 70,000 people have watched just that interview uh, in which I, I, I really tried to communicate to people, get yourself involved in this kind of intervention Get, get out there and make your voice known, and then let's all meet in D.C. Wh why? What are we going to do there? What's the plan of the LaRouche movement in D.C.? Well, take the whole, in, the initiatives that Helga Zepp LaRouche has laid out that have provided the direction for these conferences that we've hosted, including the most recent one this past weekend, which was a stupendous result, and we're going to bring the message of the new paradigm, not simply the new paradigm, but the specific proposal that the United States and Europe, we need to join with the global south. We need to uh, begin to discuss the principles upon which the next era of humanity will be based because there's no stopping the collapse of this present system. There's no holding back the, um, the failure of this neoliberal British imperial Anglo-Dutch liberal system. And the only thing uh, that they can do is try to delay or risk, try to force people into nuclear war. But increasingly nations are refusing to go along with that. And we got to get that message out along with the principles. We're organizing a process on the basis of ideas. So we're going to people, we're gonna, this is the whole plan, with a team of people coming down from New York, people coming in from all over into DC. We've got a team of at least about 12 people who are really focused from our youth organization. So we're gonna go in uh, with big beautiful banners of the, the World Land Bridge and of Helga LaRouche's initiatives. We're going to have a beautiful table out there. We're going to be getting out a new pamphlet from the LaRouche organization. There's going to be, which is on the Assassination Bureau, that also includes all of the solution concepts in it, but it has material from that, um, uh, from that uh, um, conference that we did uh, not long ago with reference to all of the assassinations and what must be done to overturn that International Assassination Bureau. And, um, but we're going to be like literally going to the youth, the many, many youth who are there, and we are going to recruit them to the concept that it is the LaRouche time. It is LaRouche time right now. This is the year of LaRouche, my friends. And if you want to participate in world history, then you better get with LaRouche and you better figure out the, con the conception, the concepts that he developed, the discoveries, because otherwise you're not going to know what to do. You're not going to know 
how to actually communicate um, the nature of this next era. And uh, if we don't have that, then we don't have much. But if we do have that, if we do have a burgeoning youth movement, then what happens is that very rapidly we're going to be able to get to top leadership all over the world at a level that even expands upon what we've already done. And for us to be able to bring those youth that we meet at that rally into an international youth conference, we ha- which we have presently intended for the 11th of March, a Saturday, where they're going to hear in depth, in detail, the LaRouche policy for the new international economic order. What, where are we going to build? Where are we going to build it? What are the main projects we need to be thinking about? What are the, what are the pathways to feeding every person on the planet, providing a productive job for every person on the planet, and rapidly bringing everything into an anti-entropic mode. So uh, that's going to be coming up. We're going to be bringing people into that. And we're just going to be fanning out across the entire thing with the solutions, with this fierce optimism that comes from an understanding of the science of the human mind, uh, which is really the the origin of this, the, the quality of mind that Lynn represents that Helga represents, that we all strive to represent. Um, and, uh, and on top of that, we're going to be going to all of the speakers, all of the organizations, and we're going to be saying, work with us. Now that the cat's out of the bag and you can talk about nuclear war and we can keep raising that bar, it is also time to talk about the physical economy. It is time to uh, uh, address what is it that is going to prevent complete destruction, complete collapse of uh, the United States and the mass death that Lyndon LaRouche warned about as this process, if this process uh, is allowed to unfold and as it unfolds. So then imagine, uh, you know, Diane Sayre up there on uh, on, on the stage speaking at the Lincoln Memorial to huge numbers of people representing the LaRouche movement, uh, putting forward things that, as of now, we're the only ones who have the policy orientation, who have the quality of, of uh, policy that is actually going to uh, you know, provide a, a pathway forward. Um, that's what's coming. And so I would encourage everyone to, first of all, come if you can, and second of all, contribute to that process in whatever way you can. We need a lot of money, of course, so please donate um, more money because we need it. And then, um, you know, let's, let's bring out as many uh, possible interventions as we can before, during, and after this process, you know, this, this, uh, this 19th rally. And what we're going to do is after the 19th, we're going to have a day we're going to take people all around uh, Washington, D.C., um, just among our youth organization, and then the day after that, we're going into the uh, into the Congress, and we are going to get meetings with everyone we can. We want you to get in touch with your uh, people, with your with your representatives. Uh, we have a, a form letter that we're going to put together to an email that people can can send, and get those meetings because we will go on them, um, and we will meet with people in the Congress and demand that they follow through on on the peace negotiations and on various exciting developments like today, Matt Gates, the representative, the Republican uh, member of the House, introduced a uh, resolution to halt all of the funding to Ukraine. And I believe at the moment there are about 10 Republican members of Congress who have signed on to that. So there is a, um, you know, there's, there's motion. There's great motion happening in the world. Uh, and we are behind a lot of it, and we just have to, you know, keep going, keep escalating. So that's what I got to tell people about what's coming up. All right, perfect, Daniel. Uh, just before we go to Jerry, and also, Daniel, if you want to stick around for the questions, you're more than welcome to do so. Um, and uh, I, I might even have a question for you also. Now, uh, to bring in Jerry, I would just start by saying I think what we're doing is we are taking back our government because we must take back our government. 
I think people should remember that FDR was almost assassinated and there was a, a plan to oust him as a president and to replace him with a man named Smedley Butler. Um, and why? It was because his idea was that people come first. That's what we're doing now. Right now, each of us have to press, has to press that through, the, through intervening on behalf of optimism, and that's what we're doing. And so uh, Jerry will be talking, uh, the title of his, um, of his talk is uh, The Coming New Epoch, The True Role of Genius in Government, the Case Study of David Lilienthal, Creator of the Tennessee Valley Authority. From the stunning insights in the creation of Franklin Roosevelt's TVA to his single-handed fight against the Cold War as the first chairman of the Atomic Energy Committee, uh, David Lilienthal is a critical concrete insight into the necessary role of genius in the coming new e-box. So, uh, Jerry, are you there? Yeah, sure. Uh, I can be heard, right? Loud and clear. I... Okay, great. Okay. Yeah, I... I uh... <laughs> well, I, I first came across David Lilienthal <coughs> uh, uh, <coughs> in the book uh, about the Roosevelt administration, um, uh, and um, a very important book uh, by Schlesinger. Um, and it occurred to me, and the people who have been, you know, I've been discussing this question of Roosevelt for, for a while. Why was I discussing it? Because Roosevelt, for 12 years, this country was run on the basis of a commitment to the general welfare. Not just for this country, but at the end of the war, Roosevelt's single-minded purpose, not just during, uh, during the war and at the end of the war, his single-minded purpose was to end British colonial rule. As I have said before, the two wars of the 20th century, World War I and World War II, were spin-offs of British colonial rule. And Roosevelt knew that. And when I say the role of genius, and most people really don't understand what genius is. I'll give you, I want to be a little more concrete because, yeah, I mean, people say Albert Einstein was a genius. Well, of course he was. But uh, the idea that, that Franklin Roosevelt was a genius, that Lincoln was a genius, and of course, Lyndon LaRouche, well, I don't think people argue on that one. Uh, but but what, what was it? I'll give you a concrete example. Roosevelt had denounced Stalin before the war started. He was very clear on the kind of tyranny, uh, the way that uh, uh, Stalin ran things. Uh, he was very, very clear. But at the height of the war, Roosevelt knew that either he could convince Stalin that there was a combination that could be put together in which his security concerns were taken into account along with the rest of the world. And that central to his security concerns would be in the post-war period, a level of loans and development that would secure Russia as a nation. 
not as a communist conspiracy of, uh, to overthrow government. Stalin was against that. In fact, it was Trotsky and Parvis, and that's a longer story, who insisted that there was no such thing as the Soviet state uh, and that there had to be permanent revolution. Stalin, as part of at Tehran, when he met with Roosevelt, agreed to disband the Comintern, the Communist International. Uh, there's a, a very uh, important book by Susan Butler, which I've gone through before. I'm not going to go through it again. So that by, a, by Roosevelt, personally, intervening on the deepest level at the height of Stalingrad, uh, uh, when Roosevelt said, you have infinite credit from the United States to fight this war. And at Bretton Woods, Dexter White had promised $10 billion, which was an enormous amount at that time, so that Stalin could buy American machine tools. And on the basis of those American machine tools, which we were going to get rid of anyway because the war was over, would be able to stabilize the economy of Russia, to stabilize it as part of a community of nations, as part of the Security Council, which Roosevelt had intended for Stalin and the Soviet Union and China as to be the bulwark against uh, and ensure that there would be never a return to colonial rule. And, and it, it, the book goes through exactly what Roosevelt did. Because he knew what the world had to be. What were the principles upon which you could secure the peace and make a, 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 that it wasn't a hegemonic view, but it was a deep understanding of the principles of government which allow for security and development. You cannot dictate the terms of other people's nations. But if you stick to the principles, or, or, or what Helga defines as the non-aligned, uh, uh, what became the non-aligned movement, uh, uh, then you could secure the future. And what would come from the future it would be very interesting. You can't predetermine that either. So that the, 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 what genius is, is not only a commitment to fundamental principles, but the courage under impossible conditions to secure those principles uh, uh, um, uh, is, is what genius is the commitment to the development of mankind as a whole. And as Lynn defined it scientifically, the increase in relative potential population density, which as Helga identifies in her 10 principles, as, a, as a, an idea of natural law, that if governments no matter how they are formally constituted, are committed to the general welfare and the future of their citizens, then that format which, which they perceive, uh, this is what's called sovereignty, uh, uh, cannot be violated. Because if they are committed to those principles, then uh, uh, the, the 
formalities of how to do that, they will, if they're honestly committed to those principles, they will see other ways, better ways, evolving ways. You know, humans are human, and they evolve, they discover, they uh, uh, change. Our ideologies, which are imposed by British rule, uh, 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 are are a way of controlling the what they call the narrative. Now, the, now I, I say this by way of preface because what David Lilienthal did, and and if you read his book, the TVA. Uh, Democracy on the March, which was written in 1943. So it was the first 10 years of the TVA. It was founded in 1933. It went to 1943. In the poorest section of the country, it lifted over half the population of Tennessee, Georgia, Mississippi, where the TVA went through. Uh, where I mean, not the TVA. Well, the TVA was the Tennessee Valley Authority. The Tennessee River went through. So uh, lifted 50% of the population out of poverty of those kind of of those different states, and that it was so incredibly successful in terms of power, uh, in terms of water management, uh, in terms of developing industry in that valley, particularly with respect to the uh, natural, uh, and I'll read you a little quote of of the way that Lilienthal thought about this. uh, but the 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 natural uh, 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 minerals that are there, the development of those minerals, and I'm just going to read you a quote uh, uh, from uh, one of the chapters uh, to give you a sense of what Lilienthal was actually up to. Quote: There is a grand cycle in nature. The lines of those majest- majestic swinging arcs. Are no more clear, uh, no uh, are nowhere more clearly seen than by the following of the course of electric power in the Tennessee Valley's way of life. Water falls upon a mountain slope, six thousand feet above the level of the river's mouth. It percolates through the roots and the subsurface's channels, flows in a thousand tiny veins. And it cu- till it comes together in one stream, then in another, and at last it reaches a TVA lake where it is stored behind a dam. Down a huge steel tube it falls, turning a water wheel. Here the water's energy is transformed into electricity and then moving Onward toward the sea, it continues on its course through ten such lakes, over ten such water wheels. Each time electric energy is created, that electricity, carried perhaps 200 miles in a flash of time, heats to incredible temperatures a furnace that transforms inert phosphate ore into a chemical. That phosphatic chemical put upon his land by a farmer stirs new life in the land, induces the growth of pastures that captures the inexhaustible power of the sun. Those pastures, born of the energy of phosphate and electricity and human invention, Feed the energies of the animal and men. Hold the soil. Free the streams of silt. Store up water in the soil. 
slowly the water returns to the great man-made reservoirs from which more electricity is generated as more water from the restored land flows on its endless course. Such a cycle is restorative, not exhausting. It gives life as it sustains life. The principle of unity has been obeyed. The circle has been closed. The yield is not the old sad tale of spoilation and poverty, but that of nature and science and man in the bounty of harmony. The reason I read that is this, to me, this whole book and the way he elaborates it was stunning. It was so, and, and the actual work of the TVA was so stunning that at the, uh, at, 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 he wrote uh, in 1953, another ending to the book. 53 million people had visited the TVA. And I'm just going to read you a little bit. Uh, Among the more than 53 million people who visited the TVA in recent years has been representatives of almost every country in the world. Since the war, there's been a marked increase in foreign visitors. They come in a steady procession. A Chinese general returning to Chongqing, complete with military cape and battle dagger. An agricultural commissioner from New Delhi. A British ambassador. A group of Swedish journalists, especially observant of the modern architecture of the new power plants a Brazilian scientist, a prominent Australian politician, a Czech electric expert, hundreds of men from the most distant lands. The TVA has served as a training ground for foreign technicians, two sport engineers and agriculturists from a dozen republics of South America, a similar contingent from China, singularly enthusiastic and intense. There has been a group of Russian engineers working with the TDA technicians on lend-lease hydroelectric plants that in 1944 will be producing power on the streams somewhere beyond the Urals. This accomplishment was stunning. And at the Bretton Woods deliberations, from the Indian delegation to the Bretton Woods, they proposed a worldwide TVA authority to look into the valleys, particularly of Africa, and develop water management, power, uh, uh, chemicals, uh, plants, uh, uh, um, and then the spin-off industries from such power, uh, 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 and that what Lilienthal insisted upon was that you do not, the people of the valley will not defer to the scientists. See, this was the British game, that a technocratic elite, this is in the open conspiracy, would run the world and that the population that science had become, how do you manipulate the population? It's called fascism, frankly, with a democratic phase. How do you, or synarchy. How do you manipulate the population such that they would tend to acquiesce? Lilienthal, in hundreds of speeches uh, uh, throughout the Tennessee Valley, thousands of speeches nationally said no the scientists will live in the valley every single engineer and scientist must live in the valley must participate in the deliberations uh, uh, of each of the communities to explain what this is you know they had no electricity frankly 
they had a whole education campaign about electricity. One of the most dramatic things they did, well, and, and this is, that's why he called it democracy on the march. One of the most dramatic things they did is they, they wanted to show what the use of fertilizers and electricity would mean. Rather than by government fiat, say, well, if you don't use electricity and if you don't use uh, uh, chemicals, uh, then you're not going to get loans, which is the way, uh, and he insisted that the, that the TVA, the Tennessee Valley Authority, had full authority on every single aspect of water management, of electricity, uh, of, of the uh, uh, power lines, uh, of uh, uh, deliberations in the community for what to do uh, with the lakes and other kinds of things. Uh, but what did he do with the farms? He created experimental farms and got the word out and farmers out from around the world, but particularly in the valley, would visit these experimental farms, learn, discuss, deliberate, change the way they plowed, change the way they lived. They, they had loan policies so that they could buy electrical appliances. They had all sorts of programs such that when the war started, uh, well, as when the buildup of the war started, the power that was generated and the community and the level of technical excellence that had been developed at the depth of the Depression in the poorest area of the country had become one of the most productive areas of the country in terms of output, but that the capacity to increase the output, they had tripled the electricity capacity to meet the war effort. And they placed the Manhattan Project at, uh, 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 at Oak Ridge on the Tennessee River because that was the place of most and most capable and rapid uh, development. So to me, this was stunning. The combination of the wisdom of this approach uh, and the uh, uh, unbelievable effects worldwide um, was stunning to me. So I decided to look into Lilienthal in a little deeper way because there had never been in our country or any other country something like the Tennessee Valley Authority. Roosevelt had to get it through with uh, Norris, had to get it through in the first 100 days because the entrenched interests in the Tennessee Valley in electricity said you cannot touch free enterprise. If you build competitive plants with government money, you are destroying free enterprise. Uh, uh, and the Congress, left to its own devices, would have never supported the TVA, never. And in fact, uh, Wendell Wilkie, who later ran for president, ran the largest electrical uh, uh, company, private electrical company, in the Tennessee Valley. And he fought Lilienthal tooth and nail and a higher congressman to go after Lilienthal had said this is a violation of free enterprise, uh, uh, that if the TVA started building, completing, uh, competing, uh, in other words, the TVA could supply electricity to what was called CNS, which was the large electricity company. They could supply electricity, but they couldn't compete. 
with government money. Now, Lilienthal uh, 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 said, look, you're keeping the rates high. My view is if we lessen the rates, we would more than compensate both you, what you have there, and what we could produce, because the idea is that the, the market for electricity and farming, if you cheapen the rates, would far exceed anything you could gouge out of a, an impoverished farming community at high rates. And, not, and it, it stayed bucolic because you couldn't build anything because the energy rates uh, and the area was so poor and the energy rates were so high, you couldn't do anything. So Lilienthal had a brawl. I didn't know this. Maybe others did. But this was a whole revolution in the idea of the role of government. And in fact, the TVA Democracy on the March was later called the most important document on government since the Federalist Papers. And I happen to agree. But this was pure invention. This it had never existed before. Nothing like this in any country had ever existed before. Now, what was the, and that, that's why I want to give you a sense of who Lilienthal is. And, and he later becomes the head of the Atomic Energy Commission. So when he was uh, in his 20s, he went to a place called DePaul University. Now, he's Jewish, um, had a very interesting father and family who were not traditional Jews, uh, 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 but certainly would have no problem being said they were Jewish. You know, they weren't that kind of Jew. Anyway, so he, in his senior year, sweeps the state of Indiana with the proposition of the role of the Jew, uh, uh, the mission of the Jew, it was called, which is stunning in and of itself that he would do such a thing. But let me read you what he did. The speech began, and he had won every single debate uh, or every single oratory uh, throughout the state. He, he became the most noted orator of, of that state. The speech began with a passionate reprise of the plight of the Jew. Quote, a people without a country doomed to play the role of a despised wanderer a perpetual world tragedy. Nevertheless, faith endured, and so too the hope for the Jew and the whole world, in spite of persecution, in spite of the plight of nations pitting Jew against Jew, this night shall end in the realization of the mightiest of themes, the unity of God and the unity of man. For the young orator, monotheism and the brotherhood of man were the indivisible components of all religion. Jews everywhere must transform so-called clannishness and a vision of the unity of God into a compelling concept of the unity of all man. He emphasized the world's unity could come only through peaceful transformation and love and, and the idea that man was created in the image of the creator. Faith was important 
for what it brought to the table of life. But once at the table, once put into action, religion, at least creedal religion, was secondary, and that the brotherhood of man came first. Well, this, this was his abiding idea from the age of 20. And he became a lawyer, not for the reasons that people become lawyers. He became a labor lawyer because in order to fight, he, he would have to go through the courts to fight for the rights of the working man. You would have to go to the courts. And that's why he became a lawyer and a very good one. He went to Harvard Law School and met some very uh, 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 reform movement there that said that you had to regulate, uh, 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 you had to regulate uh, uh, industry, which was fascinating to me. There was a, a very famous governor called Bob LaFollette. Uh, who uh, his son, because uh, he was uh, a lot older than Lilienthal, his son became the governor and appointed Lilienthal, who had then be was a lawyer, to the regulatory commission for energy in the state of Wisconsin, in which he, uh, 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 that's a long story, I'm not going to go through it, but he fought every single energy company to bring the rates down, to regulate the economy. And he was hated. The only other state to, to try to regulate energy uh, for, and uh, divest them from the holding companies that ran them uh, and looked into the books uh, of these holding companies was New York State under Franklin Roosevelt. That's how he knew of Lilienthal. So that when he appointed Lilienthal uh, and three others, it's a very complicated story there, uh, 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 but that to, to regulate on the basis of the principle of the general welfare, the TVA was the first authority to do that in the United States. Roosevelt had the same idea for agriculture, the same idea for the economy as a whole, but the entrenched interests were so uh, 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 both in government because they did not want to see a, a, an authority like the TVA because the TVA did not defer to the Department of Forestry, the Department of Water, the Department of Energy. It was an authority that took full responsibility and decentralized that responsibility uh, in, these, in uh, different uh, uh, locations so that, so that that authority could be wisely practiced. Uh, 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 it's like the local banker. Banking is not evil. Not all bankers are evil. They're not. The local banker actually knows who's a trustworthy guy, who's a guy you have to watch out for uh, to make sure the plans are right, these kinds of things, um, uh, and uh, to tap agricultural experts. But what Lilienthal insisted upon is that you had to have an informed populace and that the role of the scientist in a republic uh, is to give the quality of insight and information, but the ultimate decision was with the population. So that, so that what you had was a, 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 rather than this manipulation, which is what British policy was, what U.S. policy under 
Teddy Roosevelt under these lunatics like uh, 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 Coolidge, all these other guys uh, uh, were, we don't give a damn what the population thinks. Uh, we're just, we have the power to do it and we're going to do it. And they, and they created a complete, total economic disaster. And that what, what, the, what the combination of geniuses did, and the TVA is indicative of, of that, Wallace, uh, uh, who's a genius, worked out what had to be done in the agricultural sector right, that you had to rein in the anarchy, the real anarchy of these uh, 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 financial elites, like the Morgan interest. Remember, the first thing Roosevelt did was close down all the banks. But that you, but that you needed uh, actual geniuses and Roosevelt gave them room. Because really, what is democracy if it's properly done? Democracy is what Lynn would have called Aufschrag's Taktik. In other words, you have a mission. And without a mission, uh, 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 which, is, which was attacked violently, uh, uh, but that mission with the courage and strength of Roosevelt and the knowledge and cunning of Roosevelt and the people he inspired around him, you were able to carry out that mission on the basis of a constantly evolving, uh, uh, constantly evolving effort to draw on the creative insights of the people who were involved in actually doing it, that you couldn't run it government by diktat from Washington, not a real government. Now this to me, and I'm gonna say something which uh, is sort of stunning, but true. The Chinese economy works that way. Doesn't work exactly the way that Lilienthal would have had it, but frankly, they learned a lot from the TVA. Uh, uh, in fact, the Three Gorges Dam did bring in, uh, uh, did go to the TVA and work with them. Uh, but more importantly, you look at the Bohai, the building of the Bohai, the largest expans expansion, it's both a bridge and a tunnel. Uh, 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 the, uh, they had hundreds upon hundreds of inventions. There's a, a very famous film about it. On the spot, you could have never dictated that from a central authority, never. You had to innovate. You had to create. And therefore, given a mission of, of mankind, which is what Roosevelt did around Stalin, what he, what he intended to do around China, what he did at Bretton Woods in terms of ending colonial rule, uh, 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 and these development credits, which is what actually the World Bank and the IMF was supposed to do, stabilize the currency and issue credits, particularly dollar credits, dollar denominated credits based upon a gold uh, a denominated system, which is why uh, uh, some of the Bretton Woods thing did work. Uh, uh, that's a whole other story. Now I'm going to take a step further. Because government, the mission of government is to inculcate, inculcate genius, inculcate discovery. That's the mission of government. And the Chinese happen to be very successful at that, a hell of a lot more successful than the surveillance state and the so-called uh, fascism with a democratic face that we have. And that's a whole other story. Now, 
The atom bomb was dropped. David Lilienthal becomes the head of the Atomic Energy Commission. The first Atomic Energy Commission, 1946. The Russians did not have the atom bomb yet. And I had lectured a couple of weeks ago about after Roosevelt died, there was a cabinet meeting uh, in which they decided 13 to 3 to actually share the secrets uh, uh, jointly with the Soviet Union and to jointly develop atomic energy uh, and uh, uh, regulate um, atomic weapons, right? You couldn't, you couldn't ban it. You cannot ban a technology. You can't do it. So there's no point in it. But through cooperation and, and the uh, development concerns and the security concerns, it becomes a, it becomes a positive thing. That's what Lilienthal fought for. They wanted to make it a military uh, um, uh, nuclear energy, only military, when the nuclear, that, that, that the military would have the total control uh, uh, and keep it secret and keep it only for military. Lilienthal and the group around Roosevelt who actually created uh, 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 the atomic age said it had to be open, it had to be shared with the rest of the world, uh, and that uh, the military cannot run uh, under secrecy cloak uh, 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 the development of atomic, uh, the atom, the atom. Well, needless to say, Lilienthal was subjected to the most violent red baiting you have ever heard. Hoover tried to stop him. This guy Hickenlooper uh, uh, had four months of hearing to label uh, Lilienthal incompetent and uh, 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 with communists in the organization. I mean, it was wild. And Lilienthal went to the at the height of the Cold War, went around and said, "This cannot be secret. We have a democratic form of government. The population must be informed." of what this is, what its potentials are, and what its dangers are. Well, eventually they got rid of him. They threw him out of the Atomic Energy Commission. This is uh, an amazing story, really. But what was the first act upon leaving the Atomic Energy Commission? He was hired by the Shah of Iran to create a Tennessee Valley Authority in a critical area of, uh, of Iran uh, and that, uh, uh, remember, we had remembered that the Shah wanted nuclear energy plants all over Iran and that Lilienthal was his top advisor. He also was called in to India and Pakistan to try to develop the uh, Ganges Brahmaputra uh, uh, and work out an authority like that. And it's fascinating to me that there was going to be a Danube River TVA at the end of the war. And the guy who attacked it most was Friedrich von Hayek in the road to serfdom. That, he, that since the river cut through several countries, you could never, uh, 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 someone downriver in Czechoslovakia could not tell someone upriver in Romania 
what what they could do. That the truth is unknowable. It's all uh, 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 impossible. Now, of course, you know, we know what had happened in terms of the British Empire, the British destabilization, the long wars, the Korean War. But Eisenhower, and that's a whole other fascinating story, who, as I have indicated, was the Roosevelt man and understood you had to end colonial rule and told the British when they invaded uh, and the French when they invaded uh, 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 Egypt and the Suez Canal, you back down, you back down now. And told Paul Nixa and the group that was calling for the weaponization of the CIA, he had an open fight with them in his own uh, uh, Oval Office uh, uh, and changed that. But his crowning glory was what he proposed to the UN in the Atoms for Peace is that we could work together with the Soviet Union for Atoms for Peace. And that he had attempted to meet with Stalin before Stalin died to end the Cold War. So that was the kind of genius that Franklin Roosevelt inspired so that it didn't die when Roosevelt died. Yes, Truman was a little man and an idiot surrounded by British synergy. That's for sure true. But that what was stunning to me and there's a whole lot more I can go through, but I want to end it, uh, give maybe some Q&A. What was stunning to me, was, uh, and Wallace, of course, is one of the geniuses, and I'm going, to go, I'm going to do more on that, that government, those 12 years of Roosevelt, inspired a leadership in this country with even though he died in an untimely way and what he wanted didn't go, it laid the basis for certain principles that have reemerged under the direction of Lyndon LaRouche. I had said before that LaRouche understood Roosevelt better than Roosevelt understood Roosevelt, and that's possible, by the way that the quintessential genius of this age who lived under the Roosevelt saw what the British had done, who, who carried forth the fundamental principles that were engendered, but from a higher conception, a Vernotskyan conception of man, has unleashed a movement worldwide that can take inspiration from the genius of the past, of this new coming epoch. So that's sort of what I wanted to say. 